Well, um, I want to give a little lesson about uh, Israel in a different way, I think, than you've ever seen it. Uh, because this is some, although I've been teaching on this for 40 years, this is some it, it, new clarity of revelation that I've been getting on this just in the last couple of days, and I want to share it with you. And let's first, uh, let's open to um, Gospel of John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 1. So let's read both of them. The first verse of the Gospel of John and the uh, first epistle of John. And in John, the Gospel of John chapter 1, as you're turning there, I want to say this, that as far as I understand, John was the last writer of the Bible. Do you know that? Yeah. As far as I can tell, everybody else died before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD because they all speak of the temple still standing in their writings. Only John speaks afterwards. It seems like all of the other writers were killed or finished their writing before 65, 66, 67 because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. It seems like only John lived past that time and he was the last writer. Now, since he was the last writer of the Bible, he had an opportunity that no one else had, which since he wrote the last part of the Bible, he was the only one that could understand the Bible from the beginning to the end. No one else had that privilege because no one else knew the end of the story. So he had a perspective where he sees the Bible from the beginning to end. And when you read his writings, there's something special about that that only he can give, that he talks about the whole Bible from the beginning to end. And that's the approach that I want to talk to you a little about. You'll see, we'll get to it in a few minutes about Israel today. And, um, what, and the, the first thing before that is I want you to learn to read the Bible from beginning to end and try to understand the Bible from beginning to end. I don't mean that you just read uh, you know, Genesis and then Exodus and the Leviticus, but you, you have to have a, a steady reading plan. Well, after a number of years, you read the Bible through enough times that you have it in your mind and in your heart, the whole flow of the history and the thought of the Bible from beginning to end because there is a logical development there is a development of revelation from the first verse to the last verse, yeah. and that's what I'm going to show you today. And John particularly sees that, but you have to keep reading it systematically until you get to the point where you begin to see the beginning from the end and from the end from the, from the beginning. Yeah, and when you see that, a lot of it's going to open up to you. Yeah. And that's the first perspective I want to talk to you about today. And I want to say that in looking at that, um, although we're teaching about Israel today, I've said this many times, I don't have an Israel message. I'm not here to teach you about Israel. We're here to teach you about the kingdom of God. Yeah. We're here to teach you about Yeshua. We're, talk, we're here about talking about the plan of God. Now, there is a place for Israel in the plan of God. That's what we teach about. Yeah. We're not teaching about Israel because we're Israelis or we're Jews. We're teaching about it because it's the plan of God. And yeah. that's what we're looking for. And that's a big difference. There's no racism in this. There's no patriotism in it. There's not no, we are loyal to God and his kingdom. And the, and the Bible has a lot to say about Israel. When people ask me and say, well, why do you think? I just happened this happened this, this month. A pastor in Israel. A pastor in Israel. Two pastors in Israel. Okay, and we say, well, I don't understand why you teach about Jerusalem. I said, well, look, you don't have to agree with what I, what I think. What do you think? So, well, I don't know. I said, well, here's what we do. I said, I will change. I sort of challenged him in a funny way. I said, here's what we'll do. I will, challenge ev I will change everything I think about Jerusalem to what you believe. So here's what you do. Take this next year. Read through the Bible. Read every place where it talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Zion. And you, and you tell me what it means, and then we'll agree. But you can't tell me it doesn't mean anything because it's written about it 3,000 times in the Bible. So it's got to be there somewhere. And you know how many times it's written in the Quran? Zero. So you have to get a little perspective on this. Is this important to the plan of God? Anyway, so what I, all I wanted to say is we're interested. We're not basing this on ethnic or political. or We're interested in the plan of God in the Bible from beginning to end. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. All right, now let's with that, let's start. Let's go back to the Gospel of John, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. Bereshit ayah davar v'adavar ayah im Elohim ve'elohim ayah davar. And says this is in the beginning... 
was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, what is, what is John doing in this? Why is he opening his gospel this way? What is he doing, obviously? He is quoting Genesis. what Genesis? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He's starting the gospels by saying what we are talking about in Yeshua is starting in Genesis 1, 1. And he's going back there and he says, you look at that first passage in Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning. He says, in the beginning, Yeshua was there. And God spoke and said, let there be light. He said, God, when God spoke, that was Yeshua. And when he said, let there be light, the light was Yeshua. In other words, he's saying everything from the beginning of Genesis 1-1 to the end of the Bible, it's all about Yeshua. And it's all the same story from beginning to end. Now, that's a whole other lesson, but it's the introduction for that. What I want to say is that we believe in the whole Bible from beginning to end, that it all has the same plan, has the same idea. And when you begin to think that way, you're going to understand the Bible better and that it's all about Yeshua. Yeah. Now, here's what your mind is going to want to do. Your mind is going to want to pull you away from those two things. It's going to want to pull you away from that there's a consistent message in the Bible from beginning to end and pull you away from Yeshua being the center. One of the things I told, I told somebody this last week that was a young person, younger than me anyway, but um, I was teaching in one of, our, uh, of our, uh, one of our congregations and afterwards I said, listen, what you did was typical of almost all young people that begin teaching, that you gave a lot of principles about the Bible but you didn't talk so much about Yeshua. And I said, you need to watch that because Yeshua is the one who gives the principles of the Bible. You can talk about all the principles in the Bible you want, but don't leave him out of it because he's the one who gave the principles. You know, because your mind would say, oh, I understand this, 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 this. Wait a minute. It all came from him. But you always have to pull back and come back to the simplicity of Yeshua. Well, everyone knows that. That's right. It's simple. Make it simple. And keep it th Now, the other thing I want to say is that it's the same from beginning to end. And when you think about that, because your mind and theologians will want to divide things. What theologians do, and particularly non-believing theologian professors in, in scriptures, non-believing professors, particularly at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, they want to chop the Bible into pieces and say it has no connection with one another. They'll chop the, the, the book, the, the, the Torah, into about six different pieces. They chop, and it's got nothing to do with one another because they, they, don't, they can't see the Holy Spirit speaking from beginning to end. Yeah. And I want to challenge you just the opposite, that when you try to understand the Bible, don't try to understand a certain part of it out of context, but ask yourself, how does this fit into the whole plan of the Bible from beginning to end? Are you with me? Because when you get that perspective, beginning to end, it's all the same plan, all of a sudden, whoop, you'll see Israel fit into the right place. You with me? Let's look also what he said in, um, in uh, 1 John. Well, I'll tell you what, let's save time. He says pretty much the same thing in the beginning. We have seen, that, we have seen what happened to be. And he, again, he quotes back to the first uh, verse of the book of Genesis. Now, that's the first, book of, the first verse of the book of Genesis. And here's what we're going to do today, the main part of the lesson. Let's go to the end of the Bible. Now, what I want to do is surprise you, I think, and ask you the question, what is the last revelation of the whole Bible? The last revelation of the whole Bible. And this might surprise you. A little hot. When we look to... Um, the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, you will find that they are parallel to the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. The way the Bible starts is the same plan from beginning to end. The first two chapters of Genesis speak of creation and the Garden of Eden. Is that right? Obviously. What does it speak of? Creation in the Garden of Eden. And when you go to the last two chapters of the Bible, what do you see? The restoration of creation and the restoration of Eden. And start, the first two chapters start with creation and Eden, and then it's destroyed in the third chapter. You have the whole Bible trying to fix the problem, and then you get to the last two chapters, and you've got perfect creation and perfect Eden again. Did you get that? 
I'm gonna say that one more time because it's a difficult thing to get. When you get this, everything will start straightening out. So the first two chapters of the Bible speak of creation and paradise. Let's call it paradise now. The last two chapters speak of creation restored and paradise restored. In the middle, all the other chapters, except for the first two and the last two, is all the problems of the human race and God trying to fix the problems. When you get to those two, the begin what you see is that God planned something in the beginning before sin and Satan messed it up. But then, after God fixes sin and Satan, took him a long time, but when he gets to the end, the same plan that he planned in the beginning takes place. Do you see that? Perfect. perfect. Now, the way I would say that is what his plan was to have a perfect society with perfect people in a perfect world. That's what he wanted. So he said he put them in the Garden of Eden, a perfect world, perfect people, there was no problem. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. So we have a perfect society. That's what God wants. Perfect people, perfect world, perfect society, everything. That's what he wants. That's how it started, and that's how it's going to end. Now, then you see the first two chapters and the last two chapters. Was that clear to everybody? Was that simple? Now, the surprise is that there's an addition in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. He adds, God adds something there, or John adds something into that. He slips another idea in there. Creation, parad or the Garden of Eden, and one more thing. Let's look at it. Um, the last two chapters, Genesis, um, um, Revelation 21. He said, And I saw a new heavens and a new earth. We're in Revelation 21 1. For the first heavens and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And he said, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending from heaven, from God, as a bride dressed for her uh, groom. Now, what's the new addition here? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Let's look also in Genesis chapter, in uh, Revelation 22. This is, the la this is the last chapter. And it says here, uh, now I just want to say again here, Throughout all chapter 21, more than half of the chapter is about Jerusalem. Details, the gates, the names of the gates, what kind of jewels are on the gates, how tall is it, how wide is it, even measures it. The measuring stick is there to show that this is real. It's going to be a real building, a real wall, real gates, real, every, real names, everything. There's going to be the city of Jerusalem glorified is what you see. And then you see the same thing in chapter 22. Uh, verse 1. And he says this. And he showed me the river of living water shining as crystal, coming out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the middle of the street of the city, on the two sides of the river, was the tree of life. Now he goes on, and you, as you go through, I'm not going to go through all the verses, if you go through the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, here it is, I'm going to give it to you in one simple sentence. The last revelation of the Bible is that Eden and Jerusalem become one and the same. This is a mind-blowing thought. Let me say it again. When you get to the end of the Bible, what you see is that Eden and Jerusalem become one. All that description of Eden, the tree of life, the rivers coming out, the restored paradise that's all there, that's a description of Eden, isn't it? Is there any doubt that that's a description of Eden? 
There is no doubt. And he mentions Jerusalem here 20 times in this. The streets, the size, the walls, the gates, everything, and they become the same thing. So when you get to the last two chapters of the whole Bible, the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, the last revelation of the whole Bible, I'll say it again, is that Jerusalem and Eden converge. Jerusalem and Eden become one. The last revelation of the Bible is that Jerusalem and Eden are the same. Now, this is a tough revelation to understand. I'll say it one more time, then I'm going to explain it to you because I want, to get the, I want the penny to drop with you. All right. When you get to the end of the Bible, you see he's describing the same place, the same thing. And what he's describing is one on top of the other, Jerusalem and Eden. The rivers of Eden are inside the city. The city is in Eden. It's, it's, Eden and Jerusalem become the same thing. Now, I would say this. Now, let's begin to expand it a little bit. The idea is this, that glorified Jerusalem and a restored paradise of the Garden of Eden are the same thing. When you get to the end of time in the plan of God, Eden is restored and in the middle of Eden is Jerusalem. A glorified Jerusalem. Not this Jerusalem with the trash collectors on strike. Hallelujah. This is not the glorified Jerusalem if you hadn't noticed. It's several places in the New Testament says, and rabbis say the same thing, Jerusalem of above and Jerusalem below. Well, we are Jerusalem below if you had noticed. This is not heavenly Jerusalem. This is not glorified Jerusalem. We are the stinky trash collecting Jerusalem here on earth still. But there is a heavenly Jerusalem, and at the end of the Bible, it comes down, and it gets joined, and it gets transformed, and it gets glorified. What we see at the end of the Bible is a glorified Jerusalem, a glorified city with light of, the, of Yeshua and God and the saints of God shining out of it. And why is the city glorified? Because Yeshua is glorified in the city. Because God is glorified in the city. Is that right? Yeah. And one more thing. You are there. And you are going to have a glorified body. You don't need to turn the light on because you have a light shining from the inside of you. You walk into the room and the room lights up. The whole shit city is shining because you're there. And Yeshua is there and God is there. It's all glorified. The city is glorified because you will be resurrected living in a glorified body. Now your glorified body will be this body that you have now resurrected and empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be a star baby floating in space. See, most Christians don't believe in the resurrection. They believe in some sort of Buddhist Hinduism floating out in nirvana in somewhere in the stars. and That's not the Bible. The Bible says your body is going to get resurrected and you're even going to be able to see parts of it. You'll be a lot better looking then. Hallelujah. I'll get my hair back. Hallelujah. You'll come back, and you, and you, but, it, but it will be you. When Jesus raised from that, he said, look, I still have the marks on my hands. And then he shone like light and rose into the air. So you'll have a, a physical resurrected body that is glorified. The same thing it will be. It's not that there's the, the two Jerusalems will come together. There will be a physical city that you can walk around. You'll be able to buy hummus. You'll be able to buy falafel. Hallelujah. You'll be able to buy kube. But, and, and, and I don't know what it will be. But it will be glorified kube. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but uh, it will be a glorified city. And the same thing that and it will, and where it will be will be in Eden. And, and there will be a, a beautiful garden around it. The whole world will be beautiful, glorified. The fruit will shine with light. The water will be perfectly clean. You will sip of the water and receive eternal light. You will eat of fruit and get revelation, knowledge. You will have it be, it's going to be unbelievably wonderful. And it's all going to be there in the center of the world. Eden glorified and restored. Jerusalem glorified and restored. And they're right there in the same place. Now, there's two choices there. Either this is just two themes that have nothing to do with one another, and at the end of the Bible, they happen to come together. 
That's one option, which I don't think is the correct option. The other option is that it has been the same. It always has been the same. It was the same from the beginning, and it was the same, and it will be the same to the end. Yes, what I'm contending is that Jerusalem was in Eden, and Eden was in Jerusalem. Now let's walk it backward. You say, now why should you have Eden and Jerusalem in the same place at the end of the Bible? Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if that was the place, but if you go back right before this, you have the millennial kingdom. Jesus is here on earth in a resurrected body, and, he's le and he, the whole world is filled with peace and prosperity and joy, and he's leading his kingdom. And where is he going to be? In Jerusalem, the capital of the kingdom. Ah, well, okay, that's just in the new creation and, and the millennium. It doesn't have anything to do before that. But at the second coming, he's going to come back, right? Where is he going to come back to? Oh, Jerusalem. Well, but that was all. What about before that? But he rose in the heaven from Jerusalem. And he was crucified in Jerusalem. Well, why was he crucified in Jerusalem? Well, that's because that's where David built his temple. He had to come and be crucified where the temple sacrifices were. Well, why were the temple sacrifices there? Well, that's because that's where Abraham offered up Isaac on Mount Moriah. That's why it was there. Well, why did he offer up Isaac on Mount Moriah? If you go backwards, and what you'll see is in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God cast them out of the Garden eastward. And when Abraham made a covenant with God, God brought him back to the land of Canaan westward. Why did he bring him back to this place? He's reversing the journey of Adam, leaving Edom, he's coming back to Eden. He came back to the place. Why did Jesus have to be crucified in this city? Because he, in, the, in Hebrew thought, he was not crucified on a cross, was he? In Hebrew thought, he was crucified on a tree. Tree. Why would Jesus have to be crucified on a tree? Does that have anything to do with anything in the Garden of Eden? Wow. Why was Jesus crucified on a tree? was to reverse the sin of Adam and Eve. Now here's, you begin to see now the whole Bible is going to start straightening out for you real fast. Are you with me? I'm trying to talk slow. <laughs> what you have to see now is that Jesus was, was hanged on a tree to reverse the sin of Adam and Eve on the tree. Wow. He is the last Adam the first Adam sinned on the tree, disobeyed on the tree. Yeshua went and obeyed on the tree. It was the same action in opposite reverse. One sinned to bring death. One obeyed unto death to bring life. And it was on the same object. It had to be on the same object because he wasn't just being righteous. He was going for a certain goal which was to reverse the sin of Adam. Now, when you realize this, that Jesus was the last Adam coming to reverse the sin of the first Adam, oh, now the whole thing starts to make sense thematically. But I'm saying, why would it make sense geographically? Because, unfortunately, Christians have been taught that there is no meaning to geography. That that's not true in the Bible. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Now, so what you see is that Jesus was hanged on a tree to reverse the sin of Adam on the tree. And that's why he had to go there. That's why he had to die in the place that Adam and Eve died. That's why he had to be buried and come up from the ground. He came up from the ground in the same way that God made Adam and Eve from the ground. He had to be resurrected up out of the ground. He went back to that place to change what went wrong there. He went back to the place of the accident. He went back to the place of the crime to change the root of the crime. That's what Yeshua was coming to this earth to change change the root of the sin of Adam and Eve and to destroy the rebellion of Satan. You see what I'm saying? He had to go back to that point, right at that point. He had to be in the place, it, in the form, at what everything that happened, he had to be right there, bang, and to receive the same hit that they did and then absorb it into his body 
and absorb death and hell and Satan and evil, that everything that happened wrong at, the, at that tree and die and then come back up out of the ground. And in that sense, he switched everything. He solved the whole problem that goes back to, to the Garden of Eden. Now, and that's why in the book of Acts, when uh, the, the, the disciples started before the, before the word cross became more popular in the, in the later part of the New Testament, then when they started preaching, they used the word tree. Hang on a tree, hang on a tree. I guarantee you that they understood that they were making reference back to the book of Genesis. That he was hanging, that, uh, that the sin of the tree. And to the book of Deuteronomy that says the death penalty is on a tree. And to the book of Esther that Mordecai was to be hanged on a tree. And you start re realizing through the whole Bible, all evil gets hanged on the tree. That's just, that's the way it happens. In my, I've traced it maybe 20 times in the Bible. You see, hanged on the tree. The evil gets hanged on the tree. Evil gets hanged on the tree. Now that's, so that's what happened. So Jesus came back to that place to do it. Now, when he went back to that place, and that's why, so now let's, let's walk it forward this way. God makes the earth. In the center of the earth, he puts a beautiful garden. He tells the people to, to be fruitful and to multiply. God didn't desire for them to die. His plan was them to go out from the place, fill the earth, that the whole earth would be beautiful like the Garden of Eden, and that there would be so many people there that they would make a society out of it. And the society would have a government, and the head of the government would be Yeshua. That was the plan from the beginning. God had this all worked out before, he, before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It was all planned out. All the book of Genesis was planned out. The book of Revelation was all planned out before he started anything. You know, God is not that bad of an architect or an engineer. Can you imagine if somebody, you went into one of the downtown Tel Aviv and you said they're building this skyscraper. And you go up to the, to the contract that's building. He says, what, you know, how many floors is this going to be? And he says, you know, I don't know. We're just kind of building. We're going to see what's going to happen on the way. Could, is that possible? It's not possible, is it? As a matter of yeah, in Israel, it might be. But it's not supposed to happen that way. But with God's plan, is that plan. Now, what you know in the contracting business, right, is that you can't put the first shovel in the ground, you can't put the first nail in the wall until every single detail has already been written down, pictured, approved by the government, approved by the contractor, approved by the architect, approved by the engineer, approved by the, uh, approved by the tax people, approved by the owner, approved by... You've got to approve every single detail before you even start to do anything. You would be crazy not to do that. Well, God's not that way. God, of course, he's got everything planned out before. And so when he put them in the Garden of Eden, obviously that's where they're going to end up. And when people began to multiply, then that's where the kingdom would be centered. Now, let's come back. So God put them in there. That's what to happen. But they sinned on the tree. So they had to be removed from that place. Because God couldn't work with them. And then he waited for people. He find it until he found Abraham, who's the first man who made a covenant with God all the way of obedience unto death. And he said, no, you, I'm going to take you. If he had importance to God, he said, I want you to go back to that same place. And then you begin to follow the Bible through that God is trying to restore what he originally started. Yeah. And he comes in and he builds the whole kingdom and, God, and, and it's all coming. And Yeshua comes and he walks in as David's son and as God's son into Jerusalem. And they said, who gave you the authority? He said, my dad built this place. The priest said, who gave you permission to walk in the temple? He said, hey, I'm David's son, you get it? He says, I'm the property owner here. What are you doing here? Get out. And he comes in. And he comes in to restore heaven and earth together. All right. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Now, two other thoughts I'm going to uh, give, give you on this. And that is, um, when this all comes together, you see Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem coming down. And what that means is, throughout the whole Bible, and I want to share you this phrase that you're going to see from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. I'm going to give you one little, a three-word phrase. All right? A three-word phrase, and when you see that, boom, it's going to open up to you. All right? The three-word phrase is this. Heaven and earth. Was that hard? 
heaven and earth. How does the Bible start? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he says, when you get at the end of the Bible, you see heaven and earth coming back together to be joined once again together. And God's plan is always, what do we pray? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, it's an amazing thing. If you, as, as you begin to know a little bit about the Jewish world, and a little bit about the Christian world, it's a strange thing. Jewish people, let's start with Jewish people. Jewish people have almost no concept of heaven. There isn't any heaven. In fact, there isn't even any word for heaven. What they have is skies. You know, we have Shemayim. You know, are you going to go to the skies when you die? I mean, I, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no concept. I mean, there may be a little bit here and there and a few, but basically there's no concept of that you die and go and you live in heaven. That, that's, that's not there. Why? Because that was opened up when Yeshua came, when he rose into heaven. Now, so that concept is mostly not there, 90% not there. It's not there a little bit. But in the Christian world, there's very little understanding of a kingdom of God on earth. It's amazing. When you speak to Jewish people about the kingdom of God, what they picture is basically a transformed Zionism. That somehow there's going to be peace on earth, the capital will be in Jerusalem, the, the Messiah will be here ruling and, and reigning, and there will be peace between Israel and the United Nations. Who could believe that? All right. So, at that, and, and that's how they see, that's how they see the kingdom of God. Do they believe that? Absolutely. When you talk to most Christians about the kingdom of God, it's I'm sitting in heaven on streets of gold, hallelujah. You know, but that's not the plan of God, neither one or the other. The plan of God is that heaven and earth come together. Yeah. God never wanted a dis, detached heaven, and he never wanted just an earthly kingdom. He wanted heaven and earth together. And they got separated in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. And there was always the possibility by faith pulling them together. And they're not that far away. Jacob saw just a ladder. It's just right there. Some rabbis say it's like two apartments, one on top of the other. You know, but it's, it's but, but God wants us to live together. And it's only Jesus that can solve this because he's both the son of God and the son of man. No one, even if you understand what I'm saying, you don't get this wrong, but even God can't solve that problem because he's only a heavenly being. But Jesus, as the son of God, he's both heavenly and earthly. No human being can solve it. No angel can solve it. Only, only, only Jesus, who was both heavenly and earthly. Yeah. When he came and was born into this earth, he brought heaven and earth together. When he rose to heaven, he brought heaven and earth together. When he comes back, he's bringing heaven and earth in together. At the end, he'll bring it all together. And so what you begin to see is that the Bible plan is to bring heaven and earth together. The, the, what I would call the Jewish view of the Bible and the Christian view of the Bible to bring them together. Do we, do, Ashri, what, you don't believe in heaven? Absolutely, I believe in heaven. Well, do you also believe in a kingdom on earth? Yes. Well, don't they contradict one? No, no, they're going to come together. Heaven and earth will come together. That's our understanding of the kingdom of God. And because of the arguments between Christianity and Judaism in the past 2,000 years, those two ideas have been separated. You know, but we just want to bring them back. Let's look at one verse on that. Um, oh, what are you saying, Asher, that the kingdom of God is bringing all of heaven and all of earth together in Yeshua? Uh, is that written in the Bible? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And then we'll do one more verse after that. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Uh, verse 10. You would think you've got to read this here. Ephesians 1, verse 10. Hatochni lekabetz et hakol bamashiach bimlonta itim et mashe bashamayim vet mashe baaretz. And it says, and this is the plan, the wisdom, the predestined plan of God, the wisdom of God, is to gather all things in Christ, in the Messiah, at the fullness of times, all that which is in heaven and that which is on the earth. Yeshua brings them all together, 
heaven and earth combined together by one person, Yeshua. He's the center of all things. Now, the last thing I'll tell you, um, and I'll just tell you this quick because we, I want to take some questions from you. But um, it was interesting, a few months ago I was talking about uh, uh, my beloved friend and uh, your beloved uh, uh, discipleship school leader, Matthew Rudolph, when we were talking and praying about it, he said, and I was saying, that, to what degrees did gateways want to be connected with what we were doing here? He says, for sure. And, he, and I said, well, where's your heart in that? He said, because we know that ultimately time and geography have to come together with the prophecies. And I said, ah, that's it. That's it. I said, can I steal that from you? And he said, fine. So I'm stealing that from him right now. I'm going to give him credit, though. This, this came from Matthew Rudolph. But there is a point where prophecies, for the, for the past 2,000 years, there hasn't been much importance to time and geography. Why? Because this is the age of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can be poured out at any place and at any time. Is that true? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any place, any time. So for this period of time, time and geography are less important. Let's put it that way, because we are in the age of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can be poured at any time. But every day that passes, we're getting closer to the second coming of Yeshua. And Yeshua can't come, come back at any time, and he can't come back at any place because he lives in a body. And the body, his physical body, resurrected and glorified, but it forces him into a framework of time and place. And he is coming back. He is coming back, not in general. Did you feel him? He's here. That was the second coming of Yeshua. No, 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 no. Every eye will see. He will come back. You will be able to see him. He's not going to be a spiritual presence. He's going to come down. He's going to come down at a time, on a day. I believe it will be on the holiday of Yom Kippur. It will be on a place. He was going to hit the ground on the Mount of Olives. He will be here. He will come across. He will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. That we are moving again toward that point where time and geography have significance. And when you see that, that's when Israel and Jerusalem begin to have significance for you. Because if we're just talking about the Holy Spirit can be poured out any time, any place, you're right. There is not that much important to Israel. But you, when you realize that Yeshua is coming back, then you have to say, when is he coming back? And where is he coming back? And then all of a sudden, the Jewish calendar and the Jewish geography start to have some importance. Because he's coming back to set up his kingdom on this earth. And it brings back all of the kingdom of God into the realm of time and geography for a real fulfillment. Because I don't believe in half-fulfilled prophecies. I don't believe in spiritually only fulfilled prophecies. We believe that they will really be fulfilled from beginning to end. And when that comes in, you begin to see the importance of Israel.